Charlie White, more commonly known as Moist Critical, is the creator of the Penguin Zero YouTube channel. Throughout his career, he's dipped into many genres of content, from Call of Duty to fast food tier lists, and even creating original songs with his friends. But easily the most popular are his commentary videos, bringing to light some of these strange, dishonest, and depraved creators on a platform. Some of his videos covering these figures stand at upwards of 10 million views. But what happened to these people after he covered them? Did their careers die as the controversy took over their brand, or did they rebound and turn into something greater? Today, we'll be revisiting the most notable people covered by Moist Critical to see where they are now. While dubstep has largely been reduced to memes nowadays, it's not hard to remember how unironically popular it used to be in the early 2010s. Channels would get upwards of 500 million views on a single song during its peak, and almost everyone found ways to incorporate it into whatever they were making. If you were on the internet around this time, there was no way you hadn't heard at least a little dubstep or EDM. In 2011, Richard Geis would share his passion for this genre by creating Social Repose Music, a YouTube channel where he posted his own alternative electronic music alongside covers that were similar in nature. After a few months went by, Geist decided to expand his online persona, adopting the moniker of just Social Repose. The channel slowly gained traction over the years, procuring a small but loyal fan base of people who enjoyed his music and occasional vlogs. In 2014, Rich created a specific look to his persona, donning a purple headdress and establishing a brand identity that became synonymous with his content. While this headdress did give the channel a unique look, it also offended some who viewed it as cultural appropriation. Rich responded to these grievances after they became became more prevalent, denying any accusations and disagreeing with commenters. So the only thing that my headdress has in common with a traditional ceremonial Native American headdress is its shape. Other than that, it doesn't resemble in the symbols on the headband. It is made from a different animal. It is dyed the wrong color. The shape is similar, but everything else is totally different, making it not a traditional, ceremonial, sacred headdress. Outside of YouTube, Social Repose had gone on tour, doing 20 live shows and slowly gaining more and more fans. One of the things that could be considered the channel's first big break was when he mimicked big alternative artist voices, gaining millions of views on the most popular rendition. Nearly five years after its inception, Social Repose had reached over 100,000 subscribers and had branched out to a wider variety of content. Things like reactions, commentary videos, and short skits were uploaded a lot more now. And as the channel got bigger, fans had gotten a closer look into the personality of Richie and developed a connection with him as a person. The same could also be said about his new girlfriend Ayala, a content creator that Richie had been collaborating with for a while. The two would officially begin dating publicly, and afterwards Ayala appeared a lot more frequently on the channel. From here, Richie got more comfortable with Ayala, and even made a joke video where he faked a breakup with her. Unfortunately, the false reality portrayed in this video would soon become a very real one. Around this time, Social Repose had gotten another big break. Popular YouTuber Leafy is here had recently covered his channel, and millions of people were about to see his content for the very first time. Social Repose is a YouTuber that makes vlogs, music videos, and dresses like a f***ing bird. Now I have no issue with this guy's content whatsoever, I think that some of his vlogs aren't even that bad. To his, and Leafy's surprise, the infamously toxic fan base of Leafy's actually responded positively to his music. This sudden surge of viewers nearly doubled his number of subscribers at the time, reaching almost 600,000 pretty quickly. Following this newfound popularity, Rich started collaborating with channels of a similar size, one of these being Jacqueline Glenn, another alternative-style YouTuber. The collaboration that ensued pretty much encapsulated the duo's ideology and comedy. They posted a video of themselves drinking while reading the Bible together and mocking it. From the video itself, there's a clearly flirtatious atmosphere, and it's clearly a moment that planted a seed of interest in each other from the two creators. Ayella had actually recently broken up with Rich and went on a live stream after the Bible video warning Jacqueline not to pursue him. She claimed that he had cheated on her with multiple people, and he had been a terrible person throughout their relationship. Richie cheated on me a lot. That's true. He really did. With a lot of people. Multiple people. For sure. That's the real thing that happened. Jacqueline, largely ignoring this warning, eventually did get romantically involved with Rich, and the two officially became a couple a few weeks later. This time, however, Rich wanted this relationship to be largely private in order to avoid more drama. Eight days after this, though, he would contradict himself by recording his proposal to Jacqueline and getting engaged the same day. Regardless, the now engaged couple would start appearing in each other's videos and growing each other's channels. Social Repose's content had largely shifted by now, focusing less on music and much more on conventional commentary. For the next few months, everything seemed great. The channel was doing well, and so was Jacqueline's, and the relationship between them seemed to be flourishing. That is, until history decided to repeat itself. Almost a year after Rich and Jacqueline started dating, and half a year after they had been engaged, Jacqueline would upload a video titled, I'm an Idiot. Richie was so willing to like 
put me in videos and like I just felt like he was so proud to be with me and I took that as such a compliment. But now um, we are not together anymore. There is this girl that he dated briefly a few years ago. He reconnected with her after his last relationship ended and they stayed in touch. And a few months after we started dating, like officially started dating, um, I he slept with her and they stayed in touch throughout our entire relationship, our, uh, the entire relationship. And on his most recent tour, the first date, it was I think New Jersey or New York. I don't know exactly where, okay? It, uh, first date on the tour, she went to his show and he pulled her into a bathroom for a quickie. I know this because I went through his phone and read his texts and no, I don't feel sorry about it. Viewers were not happy, demanding that Rich explain himself. A few hours later, Richie himself uploaded what looked like an apology. There's obviously a dark side to everything, clearly. You know, everyone was incredibly devastated when they heard that we had broken up because I did cheat on her, just like I did my ex-girlfriend, which everyone knows about. Now I will say that this video retrospectively is not as bad as some say it is, considering his main concern seems to be that his dirty lie laundry was aired rather than stating that he had done nothing wrong. That being said, he also realizes that he probably shouldn't have dated another YouTuber if he didn't want this information to be out there at all, especially considering he previously stated he didn't want any kind of publicity to his next relationship. And then he widely publicized his next relationship, which was with a public figure. The apology is also hurt by the fact that instead of just taking responsibility for his own actions, he does a lot of, well, she knew what she was getting into. If Rich hadn't created such a public presence with Jacqueline, then the issue wouldn't have blown up the way it did. But because their engagement was so public and they did so much content together, their fan base became accustomed to that content and the parasocial attachment to their love life. The fans were invested in them being together. So of course, they were outraged when it was his fault that they broke up. Three days after this was posted, Critical covered it in his video, Worst Apology on YouTube. During that, he remarked how disingenuous social repose seemed and how it looked like he was either trying to make up excuses or extend the video past the 10 minute mark. I cut a few things out here, but it really served no purpose. I don't even see why he would talk about it unless he was really trying to stretch this video past 10 minutes for ad revenue, which would be an incredibly douchebaggy thing to do. What he was saying is he, he vowed never to have another public relationship since he cheated on his last girlfriend, but then he met Jacqueline and obviously had a public relationship. And he also talked about another promise he made a while back where he said he would never ever cheat on anyone ever again. And he was wrong, just like my father when he said I would be six foot five when I grew up. Charlie's scathing criticism made this video explode, racking up almost 8 million views. A few hours after it went live, Social Repose would lose 20,000 subscribers and even posted a video of himself watching his channel die. After the dust had settled, his apology video had received 75,000 dislikes and anything he posted to his channel would get bombarded as well. Now, it's not like Critical was the only person criticizing him or that his fan base was particularly invested in Richie's channel before this, but thanks to how succinct he worded his video and how many views it got. To those outside of his audience, he was just kind of seen as the guy who didn't feel bad for cheating on his girlfriend. And it didn't help that his girlfriend was also more famous than him. Years later, this controversy would also be featured on Charlie's YouTuber apology list, being ranked in the A tier. Next up, we have another big one. This is Social Repose's apology for cheating on another YouTuber named Jacqueline Glynn. And I actually made a video on this one where I called it the worst apology on YouTube. And to be honest, it still just might be. So I think this apology from Social Repos deserves an A tier in just how f***ing terrible and horrible it is. The original video from Richie was uploaded on November 5th, 2017, and while he did receive a steady decline in viewership past that point, I think it would be facetious to say that Charlie was the sole cause. Richie himself was a part of the alternative music scene that began on sites like MySpace, largely tied to scene and emo culture around the Vans Warp Tour. That's why many of his song covers are from artists like Panic at the Disco and Bring Me the Horizon. This scene was already having a decline in cultural currency around the time his apology was released, and as a result, what he really lost was the audience that was there for him and Jacqueline's relationship, the people that wanted the couple content, because there was no more couple content. And while his most popular uploads are from prior to the breakup, it's not like he hasn't had videos crack 500,000 views since then, which is impressive for a channel as old as his. But realistically, the odds were already stacked against him, his content has become more infrequent after the breakup, and he hasn't made a huge effort to innovate with what he posts. So while Charlie's popular video is a fun scapegoat for his decline, in reality, there's no one to blame but himself. There are two kinds of people in this world, those who know Riley Reed and liars. Even if you genuinely don't, you probably know the equally infamous motif that gives you a pretty good clue about what her line of work is. 
It wouldn't be a stretch to say Riley is one of the most popular adult actresses of all time, only being topped by a select few. Well, she's been topped by many, but you get what I mean. Riley has won several adult video-related awards, including Most Popular Female Performer, Best Actress, and even Social Media Star of the Year. In fact, she's gained so much widespread attention that there have even been mainstream memes centered around the actress's career choice. Riley, being very aware of these, has heavily leaned into the comedic side of the industry and largely embraced the memes. A good example of this would be a rap song she made in 2016, with lyrics pertaining to her more famous endeavors. Most notably, though, she infamously dropped the gamer word in this song. General reception of the song was pretty mixed, with some viewers finding it great and others not so much. One of the few rappers that lives the life they rap about. This hits different when you're deaf. One viewer in particular especially didn't like the song. Critical, uploading worst rap ever created. In it, he essentially just roasts the lyrics while inserting jokes along the way, critiquing how absurd the hypersexualized song was and how we did not find it that funny. In modern times, this video would be pretty out of place, but back in 2017, content was very different. Back then, if you wanted to watch commentary videos, you had to hop on your dinosaur and either watch a dude with CSGO surf gameplay or another dude dressed like a green alien talking about the weird objects his audience liked to mail him. The video by Charlie did pretty good and got a solid 4 million views, yet Riley never responded and the subject was left to dissipate in viewers' minds. A year later, however, Riley would get mixed up with Critical once again. Charlie had quote retweeted a fan drawing of her in a certain position spreading a certain something, and he talked about how he found it amusing that the artist used crayon to do this. The actual tweet he made is now now deleted, but the video he made addressing what happened afterwards is not, and attempts to explain how he didn't see the interaction as that serious. He just thought the art was funny, so he wanted to say something funny about it, to the extreme anger of the artist, as well as the adult star herself. And then I guess people found it and told the artist that I said that, and then the artist called me an asshole, and it just, then Riley Reed retweeted that saying I'm an asshole, so then they were just double teaming me, and you know, it all stemmed because, I mean, come on, it's a crayon drawing of a porn star's asshole. How's that not entertaining? The pristine artist of this piece responded after the video was dropped, thanking him for saying that she was talented, and that's where the situation pretty much ended. The actual video got 10 million views, but Riley and her career was virtually unaffected, and she just kept doing what she had been doing for the past few years to make millions. Fans had a good laugh, and that was it. Today, Riley has come out and spoken about how she regrets doing adult videos, saying how her family refuses to talk to her, and it ruined her perceptions of relationships, as well as making her stray away from having kids. I've lost my whole family, and it sucks. So a lot of times when people ask me if they should do and I tell them no. I tell them that it makes life really hard. It makes dating really hard. It makes your family life really hard. It makes intimacy hard. It, you're putting yourself out there and the world is now judging you. You have to be okay with being shamed every day of your life. I don't even want to have children because I do but obviously, this was for reasons unrelated to Charlie, who just wanted to make fun of a rap song and fan art of one of the most popular female stars of our era. Ricegum is a YouTuber who rose to fame during the mid-2010s and used to be one of the most influential creators really ever. His claim to fame was his roasts and diss tracks, with the latter receiving over 100 million views on some uploads. If there was one word to describe his content, it would be hype beast centric I think that's two words, but he made vlogs, commentary videos, and was always trying to insert himself into whatever controversy was going on. While he was a, a commentator of sorts, he didn't fit in with channels of the time like H3H3, who sought to poke fun at modern e-celebrity culture. Rice Gum instead played directly into modern celebrity culture, constantly flexing his cars and how much money he made. This caught Critical's attention, which led him to post a video aptly titled Douche Tubers. Despite the slightly clickbait thumbnail, as the video had little to do with Rice Gum himself, Charlie did hone in on the flexing from a similar content creator, Ryan Franklin, comparing him to Rice and calling them both very obnoxious. He is always flexing, and flexing is one of the main things with douche tubers. I really personally don't understand why people will just stand for that. That's just so insulting and spitting in your face. Hey, you've supported me. Now I'm going to brag to you that you don't have these things. So f you. Which, you know, like, cool, whatever, I like, don't actually care, but apparently I'm a hypocrite because I complain about people doing clickbait, but then proceed to do clickbait myself. Now, I sort of get your point, but at the same time, your points are irrelevant, all right? They're dumb, they're stupid. I mean, I do the odd misleading thumbnail, the odd misleading title here and there, and if you're dumb enough to, like, you know, be misled and, like, actually go onto the video, like, I've clickbaited you, I won, I've got the extra view, like, you're so dumb if you've gone onto the video. I'm in firm agreement with Ryan on this point here. 
If you are a fan of Ryan Franklin, you are dumb, and you are stupid. And while the flexing from people like Rice was pretty insufferable, it hardly constituted calling him a bad person. Just a very, very annoying one. That is, until the mystery brand controversy happened. When you get any amount of audience to tune into your content, companies begin looking to market their own products to that audience. This comes in the form of sponsorships, which are a helpful way for independent content creators to make money. They've become especially prevalent since 2017, when Google's ads became a less predictable source of income. But that also includes brands with poor reputations, one such brand being Mystery Brand. Yes, that's that's the name of the, the company. Mystery Brand was an online gambling site akin to things like CSGO crate unboxing, but with real-life items. Users could purchase virtual mystery boxes containing various items, with a possibility of winning luxury goods like designer clothes, shoes, electronics, or even expensive cars. The allure of potentially scoring high-value items drew in a substantial amount of interest, and many of those interested were impressionable young viewers who many would say should not be shown gambling content, which can lead to harmful habits. In late 2018, RiceGum partnered with Mystery Brand and promoted their platform to his audience in his video, How I Got AirPods for $4. Rice would win expensive prizes and continue encouraging his viewers to try their luck as well. Like, if they give me a fidget spinner one more time, bro, I'm punching my monitor. I'm just gonna have to... AirPod! Yo, I be still having the cords. Like, I don't even have these yet. I spent $4 for this. Yo, I just finessed the website. $4 AirPod. I'm not even gonna sell it back. I'm gonna ship this to my house right now. So you guys can see my balance right here. I started with like half of this and then I just kept opening stuff, got some cool stuff, and then I like sold back. So I made back some of the money. I'm up right now though. So. Almost immediately, Rice's video faced backlash due to the nature of the sponsor. YouTubers like H3H3 and even PewDiePie criticized him for exploiting his fan base, which primarily consisted of minors, by promoting a potentially addictive form of unregulated online gambling. The ethics of endorsing a platform with no clear regulations or age restrictions came under scrutiny, sparking debates about the responsibilities of influencers when endorsing products or services. He made a video in partnership with Mystery Brand promoting their product, which is a gambling site aimed at children aspiring to be a douchebag. You know, those kids that are growing up watching people like Rice Gum and Jake Paul going, Mom, Dad, when I get older, I want to be an asshole. One of the central issues surrounding Rice Gum's involvement with Mystery Brand was the lack of transparency. Many viewers questioned the authenticity of the winnings showcased in his unboxing video. Allegations arose that the outcomes of the mystery boxes were predetermined, making it appear as though Rice Gum consistently won valuable items to entice his audience, when in reality, it was very unlikely they would win anything good at all. News articles have been published explaining the current controversy, and Rice, as a result responded a few days later it's true it's true i'm an asshole like what was i thinking like i can't really do much because i already did it the damage has been done you guys already saw a money hungry side of me and it is what it is and there's nothing i can really do but say sorry and give you these amazon gift cards so i'm sorry it just wouldn't happen again amazon cause 10 to 20 dollars just a little giveaway it's, it's the least i can do after you know this you know um okay have a good day guys i'm sorry again i hope you guys can forgive me Let's have a good year? Yeah? No? Okay. Um. Alright. Alright. During his video, he basically expressed indifference to the criticism and had little remorse for having promoted this product. And just to twist the knife a little further, as a way to make it up to his fans, he promoted expired Amazon gift card codes as if that would make it all better. Critical, while slightly late to the party, still eventually made a video detailing his view of the drama and Rice's initial response. Oh, ch ch hey guys, I stole a lot of money from you. I I'm sorry. I, I got you this Subway sandwich. I hope that makes up for it. I I'm, s I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just such a blatant disregard for giving a shit about his fans. Openly just doesn't care. As the drama intensified, legal and ethical concerns surrounding Mystery Brand's operations and RiceGum's promotion of the platform came to the forefront. Regulatory authorities began investigating the website, and Rice would distance himself from the platform due to the potential legal ramifications. And many in the public became even more angry once they found out Rice may have made upwards of $100,000 for this promotion. In a Verge article, the CEO of Mystery Brand would say, We do not need to physically own these cars or houses to include them as prizes in the box. If the user were 
were to win such a prize, we would either offer them the exact money value of the prize, or our representatives would personally fly in the city of the winner and help them with the purchase of a car or house. And this obviously sounds very misleading given the nature of the ads. They advertise that people would win the actual item, not a dollar equivalent. And to this day, it's unknown how many people actually won items from the service that are worth much of anything, what likelihood there is of winning these rare items, etc. If you go on Mystery Brand's site today, your antivirus software probably will try blocking you from entering. However, if you proceed forward, all you'll find is a blank page. It seems that no one can find out where the website went and what happened to all the money they made, leading some to believe it truly was a straight-up scam. In the same way that some influencers do rug pulls by promoting a cryptocurrency to inflate its value, it seemed like this company was created with the intention of being promoted by influencers, and as soon as the controversy began, they just shut down the product. Rice Gum and Jake Paul would not be affected after this controversy, viewing it as a small career setback and nothing more. By this time, Rice had already become less active on YouTube, clearly losing interest in making videos and being past his peak of popularity. After a few years of sporadic uploads and a failed attempt to start a family channel with two of his girlfriends, Rice would go into retirement in 2021, leaving many to wonder where he went. But in 2023, he made a comeback to the internet, streaming on Twitch and teasing that he would be exploring streaming contracts. With sites like Kick and Rumble on the rise, the independent platforms are always looking for more talent to bring new users to their sites. Rice, being someone with 10 million subscribers and a loyal following, would have no issue pulling upwards of 10 or even 20,000 people to watch his streams, and as a result, a bidding war began. Aiden Ross, someone who Rice helped out early in his career, infamously stated that he would leave his new home base, Kick, if they did not sign Rice Gum. Kick, if we do not every, if we do not do everything in our power to sign Rice Gum, we are fucked. If Rumble gets Rice Gum before us, we are fucked. And I am ripping up the contract and going over there without a contract. Well, in July of 2023, Ricegum announced he would be signing a deal with Kick's main competitor, Rumble. While the exact amount he received for his contract is unknown, many have speculated it's an eight-digit figure, meaning Rice got a substantial payout from the deal. That being said, Aiden Ross is still on Kick. What does a fastest mean? Um, it means you are a far-right authorization on you on. Ultra does it, ultra, ultra not it. Oh my God. With his return to the internet, Rice has been revisiting a lot of his old drama to comment on how he feels about it today. Seemingly thinking he's owed an apology from those who criticized him in the past. That's something he did receive from iDubs, but Charlie maintains his hatred of Rice gum even years later. He tried streaming GTA RP, but after getting insulted by the chat constantly, he eventually called it quits there too. I already know his whole fucking story, man. This guy is just such a fucking L. All right, he was for a long time Time, my least favorite person on the platform. So I kept up with him, man. I was like a full-blown hate watcher. He was a full-blown hate watcher. I, I was his parasocial enemy. Like, what's good with bro? While the Penguin Zero channel may not have ruined the career of Rice, his combined effort alongside other creators did help shed light on a controversy that many may have not otherwise seen or been aware of. It definitely hurt Rice Gum's reputation to those outside of his audience and painted him as someone who had very little empathy for those he may hurt. Mystery Brand is now assumed to be defunct, while Critical and other YouTubers who raised awareness are largely credited with his downfall. And while Rice Gum still maintains an audience, the majority of the internet outside of that very limited reach sees him as a clown. Twitch has been home to a wide variety of content over the years, but mostly gaming-related stuff. Whether it be speedrunning or Let's Plays, the platform has generally been a place for the gamer nation to rise up and watch some of their favorite internet personalities play those games. However, in the past few years, there's been a few emerging scenes as the interests of creators and viewers alike have diversified. One of these categories is Twitch politics, largely pioneered by streamer Destiny, at least prior to his ban from the platform. Destiny inspired a litany of other streamers to take his combination of gaming and politics to their own shows, with people like Hassan Piker and Vosh coming directly from his community, getting their start as recurring characters on his stream. One such member of the Twitch politics community is Bad Bunny, a self-identified leftist who had a number of collab streams with Destiny prior to their falling out. She then associated largely with people like Mike from PA and Hassan Piker. At this point, she became known for various viral clips in which she said outlandish things, which would then be reposted to sites like Twitter to call her a horrible person. My value is so much more than all of your value put together, everyone in this chat like, I know every life has value, but like my life is far more valuable. All your lives have value, but mine is much more valuable than your life. And the fact that you don't even acknowledge this really disgusts me. It's like when you see like a super, super, super ugly dude that goes up to like a 10 and is like, hey, babe, you want to go out? It's like insulting. You don't realize what's happening here, do you? You think we're on the same level. That's insulting. And the fact that you think, chatters, that you're on the same level of value as I am, 
is, to be quite frank, insulting. Now, it's important to say that this clip is probably a joke, and as an entertainer, her actual opinions are often exaggerated for entertainment value. That being said, one of her worst tendencies would be ironically begging for money on stream when she felt her viewers were not donating enough. Please give me fucking money. I wish I could, but I'm so poor, but thank you for stream for us, even though some of us are poor bums. What happened to all my pay pigs? I'm on a pay pig drought right now. Every time someone doesn't subscribe, Nebel sheds a tear. What do you want from me, chat? What can I need to possibly do to make sure that this stream doesn't die because I can't afford to keep it going anymore? As a general rule for streamers and content creators in general, e-begging is frowned upon. It's a cheap way to guilt trip your audience into paying you when, of course, the real way to earn donations is just to make good, honest streams that viewers will want to donate to automatically. But that's a trial that's too turbulent for some who would rather constantly remind their audience that they're not doing this stream for free. No, they're, they're only there for that bag. Bad Bunny had committed this cardinal sin on a number of occasions, but to very little attention outside of her own audience. Unfortunately for her, in 2020, someone decided to clip one of these instances and then repost it to other sites. Five dollars a month. How are you have hours of time to watch me and not five dollars? I don't know, what are you doing with your life where you have hours of time to watch Twitch and not five dollars to provide for the content that you're watching? On January 20th of 2020, Charlie would post a video titled The Greediest Streamer on Twitch with her in the thumbnail itself. The majority of the stream is spent begging and shaming people into giving her money. Like, how do you think, how are you consuming this free entertainment? Like, how do you think free entertainment is available to you? It's because other people actually provide money so you can be a cheap ass. That's it. Chat, I haven't got a donation or a sub for an hour. What the f for an hour? What the fuck? Charlie was under the belief that this was not a joke at all, but instead, Bunny was genuinely trying to guilt her audience into donating to her at every opportunity, and his audience seemed to agree. Does she not realize that people can have hours of free time and not have extra money? You know, like teenagers who don't have jobs yet? I doubt she has many fans that are adults. She's right about two things, she's not seen as a respected content creator, and whoever watches her is wasting their time. Her streamer comrade, Mike from PA, also made an effort to defend her on his own stream, stating that the real reason people were mad at her is because she's a woman, and that the audience is sexist. And the reason why this is getting retweeted and liked so much is because she's an attractive woman who didn't act like a nice person, which is what makes frus sexually frustrated incels angry. Woman not acting, woman out of her place, me mad. Bringing a sensitive social issue into a petty internet drama made Mike look pretty ridiculous to the audience, and his defense was not received well. He seemed to get even more irate when he found this clip of Dr. Disrespect mocking Bad Bunny, at which point he went full white knight mode. Yeah, listen, if people are gonna watch me for free, you better line up the contracts. Yeah, I don't work for free. If they're sitting in the channel watching me for free, I'm gonna be pissed off. Wow, He's this only class. has 980 views, and it's from Dr. Disrespect, one of the biggest streamers oh, on the dude. platform, and nobody cares! It's almost like you're sexist! It's almost like you've been exposed right f***ing now by me! Meanwhile, others took a different approach to defending her, claiming she was just trolling, and the entire thing was a bit that had bamboozled the entire internet. Yes, guys, I've seen this. It's funny. This girl's clearly a troll. Don't get baited. I used to do this same bit. She's baiting outrage for more views and Bonos. Classic. Regardless, for the time being, it seemed like there were some short-term returns on this viral clip. Charlie's video about her received 13 million views, leading some small portion of those viewers to trickle down to her audience. Bad Bunny got over 100,000 new followers on Twitch. And while a few other clips of her would go semi-viral, no single video from Bad Bunny would ever explode in the way this one did, and she didn't receive a substantial increase in regular viewership. Since then, Bad Bunny's rebranded her Twitch channel to Kira Chats, and while she remains on Twitch to this day, she's somewhat inactive. When she does go live, she averages 242 viewers, despite having over 500,000 followers, having sent started an OnlyFans to collect some extra cash. With Bad Bunny, it's more arguable whether or not her career was hurt by Critical. Surely, his video calling her out didn't help her discoverability, but even so, her viewership hasn't had a sharp decline as a result of his video. Instead, she's remained relatively consistent with the small audience she does have. So maybe it's more accurate to say that there wasn't much to ruin in the first place.
There are very few people who could say they've created mainstream memes. Even fewer could say that they themselves are a meme. Brian Moreland or EDP445 could say both. Rising to fame in the early 2010s, EDP would make short videos often screaming about his beloved football team, the Philadelphia Eagles. One of the first videos to put him on the map and go viral was his rant about the team's recent trade. Chip Kelly, what the f are you doing out there in Phil? What the f You released Trent Cole. Okay, fine. I think it's stupid as f Okay, okay. You trade LaShawn McCoy. Motherfucker, we don't even have a fucking running game now. This was many people's first taste of EDP's content style, often making clips where he talks about poop or jerking in a very blunt and comedic manner. After all, his name was literally Eat Dat P 445 EDP had established himself as an obscure content creator for the time being, showing off his larger-than-life personality with videos such as I flooded the toilet at Chipotle and Best P to beat your shit too. People were drawn to his content format and honesty, and many of his videos would be shared outside of his circle, increasing his viewer base and more importantly, his prevalence in the mainstream. One thing that fans had taken notice of was EDP's hypersexualized nature, making unironic videos like top 200 porn stars of all time, and even getting sued by a sex hotline for refusing to pay the $20 fee because he found the services inadequate. After this incident, he promised to never call these lines again, mostly playing off this very real legal issue as a joke. Fans accepted this as just another byproduct of his online character, and with a name like EDP, you can't really blame them. Good evening, Twitter. This is your boy, Eat That Pussy 445, and about like 30 to 45 minutes ago, I beat the f out of my so goddamn hard that I can't even feel my left leg. My left leg has went totally numb. EDP wasn't just making viral videos, his persona has slowly become the thing that was viral. People loved his straightforward attitude along with his absurd wacky faces. It was almost like he was born to become a living sh post. Constantly pumping out uploads, it would be almost impossible to list all of his videos that have gone viral. Going on shows like Tosh.0 and even The Howard Stern Show, the sudden surge in popularity for him was clear. EDP's fame reached such a height that he even got invited to hang out with famous rapper Tyler the Creator. It was hard to hate EDP, and most people that weren't even fans of him will still say that they found him funny. Things were great, until rumors started to swirl around around potential allegations. What's this, you fucking piece of shit? What's this? Huh? What's this, motherfucker? In April of 2021, a Chris Hansen-style channel called Predator Poachers released a video showing text messages from EDP and confronting him in person. They had posed as a 13-year-old girl, and some of the texts EDP had sent were downright horrific. For obvious reasons, I won't get into specifics, but I will show this picture that was memed to death after the situation unfolded. EDP had gone in person to meet up with this 13-year-old. When the Predator Poachers confronted him, he would make excuses and talk about how he only wanted to go get a cupcake. Adding on to the pile of memes, this controversy had already created again so what brings you out here today um well i was uh coming out here to glasses off okay go ahead well i was actually coming out here to pick up a cupcake <laughs> and then go back home um there was you know nothing that was going to be sexual involved because i'm not like that you know well obviously the text messages and stuff like that you know what i mean Critical, watching this all go down, jumped on a live stream and began going over the footage. If viewers didn't know what was happening before, they most certainly did now. Charlie would upload a full version of the stream on his YouTube channel, which instantly gained 2 million views in under a day. He voiced his absolute disgust with EDP, barely even able to keep his cool attitude that was prevalent in most of his videos. The dude was genuinely angry, and you couldn't blame him. Wanna bend you over my table and s- Oh! Oh! I just wanna throw you on my bed and lick you up- Oh! What the f***? This is worse than like 50 shades of gray writing, and that's horrible. Today, this video has 16 million views, and a comment section filled with people horrified that one of their favorite internet memes happened to be a pedophile. This was so painful to get through. Charlie's humor was the only thing that made it bearable to listen to, but I couldn't even watch the actual video. Scroll through the comments most of the time because some parts really hurt to listen to. Charlie had felt passionate about this controversy, uploading a second video detailing that while predator poachers did a good deed exposing EDP, they also had their own skeletons in the closet. 
it. The organizer, Alex, had his own sordid past and just a general vibe of creepiness in some of the clips that had been unearthed. Charlie made note that Alex was also noticeably capitalizing on his time in the spotlight, making merch and actually withholding more clips and context so that the YouTube video could be monetized. It seemed to him that Alex prioritized making as much money as possible instead of exposing EDP. Despite this, Charlie made it clear that this didn't discount what EDP had done and he was in no way defending either of them. In his mind, they were both bad and both deserved backlash, but obviously EDP was the guy trying to groom kids, so he 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 was worse. Yeah, the guy fucking sucks ass. Like, he's not a good person. He did a good thing, but he's not a good person. You can point out the good thing and also point out that the person is bad. It, it, it's not one or the other. It can be both. EDP's bad? Check Goldstein. Alex, Predator Poachers Alex is bad. As a result of the controversy, several social media platforms and websites began banning EDP, and the Predator Poachers were also banned. YouTube was the first to take action, demonetizing EDP's channel before terminating it altogether. Twitter and Instagram also banned his accounts, preventing him from accessing some of his biggest platforms. Additionally, various forums and websites where he had a presence, such as Discord servers and fan communities, immediately distanced themselves from him and disallowed his participation. But he was now a liability to any business he associated with. The backlash against EDP was intense and widespread, some people arguing that he should face legal consequences for his actions, while others maintaining that his online presence should be permanently removed to protect potential victims. Regardless, legal action unfortunately never happened due to the poor planning and execution from the predator poachers. As a result of this, official authorities dropped the case, letting EDP walk as a free man. Critical uploaded an official EDP update half a year later. Despite the controversy fading away, people were still keeping tabs on him, looking at the jobs he was trying to get to get by, and even tracking down the motel he was staying at. Charlie found this amusing, commenting that this was exactly what someone of his caliber deserved. This is like when Shia LaBeouf put a flag in the middle, middle of Bumble f nowhere and people on 4chan found it using star constellations and airplane routes. They're finding EDP in his suitcase across the, the country. A global game of where's Waldo. With no way to get a legitimate job, EDP constantly tried to make new accounts on platforms that aren't mainstream in an effort to reestablish his online career. Having to resort to a streaming service known as Big O Live, EDP would attempt live streaming on this back alley platform, only to get dunked on by everyone viewing it. Critical had taken notice of this and made it a habit to update his audience on what was going on with EDP, potentially dissuading onlookers from accidentally supporting someone they didn't know the background of. But he hasn't been banned on there and he's been doing live streams and trying to make money that way. But the live streams are basically him just getting dunked on by the people that still follow him. He's like that clown at the carnival where you pay money to throw a ball to dunk him in some water. So that's where he's like making his living, I think. OMG, EDP, I'm such a big fan of you. Like, I'm being so serious. Thank you. How, like, how's life been? Like, why did you come to Big O? What the f is Big O? This app. Oh, you mean Big O? Oh. Yeah. You know what the f yeah, you're talking about? Yeah. Um. Like, you can find some bad bitches out here too, bro. You can find some bad bitches. <laughs> Listen, man. I'm cool on that bullshit. So you don't want bitches, but you want kids? Block him. He's gone. Get him out. You bad, bad ass, you big ass bitch. Just don't make that shit look up. You bad ass bitch. You like touching on little kids. You want a cupcake? Bryant eventually found a way to get on TikTok without getting banned. Not only that, but he actually started blowing up, reclaiming some of his fame, and getting millions of views. It seemed that most TikTok users had barely heard of the situation that happened, so they were either happy to see him for the first time, or to see him again. TikTok is also known to have a user base of mostly children, or boomers, so that could have been a contributing factor to this as well. Charlie, now furious that he was so easily able to regain a part of his following, uploaded EDP445 made a TikTok and it's very popular, displaying an attitude of peer disgust, Charlie remarked how genuinely sickening it was to see TikTok allowing EDP on the platform, citing that it was a much larger problem with the community as a whole. Which is why no community's been welcoming, welcoming him back onto the platforms, except for TikTok, because it is a platform that is notorious for not giving a sh** about the safety of the kids on there. And make no mistake, a lot of the user base is kids, but they don't take it seriously there. There's been so many cases of horrible sh** happening on TikTok, and the people that were behind it still doing just fine to this day. So I'm not surprised that EDP found TikTok as a place to call home, and he'll probably continue to do well on that platform, which is extremely sad to say. A few months after after his return to TikTok, EDP tried to make another return to YouTube, but instantly failed after Critical and Mudahar called on fans to report the channel. This somehow sparked a ban from TikTok right after, making his career plummet once again. EDP had now been banned from what seems like every single platform, and even fan channels were getting taken down that re-uploaded his content. However, like a cockroach, EDP is somehow
somehow found a way to stick around. Most recently, he's actually come out and apologized, fully admitting to what had occurred despite never specifically saying what happened or what he did. At long last, after two years of constantly banning anyone even mentioning this subject, he had finally admitted to his transgressions, albeit not very well. Charlie, disgruntled at this point and probably wanting to discuss anything other than EDP, asserts that this apology was a bunch of baloney. He didn't buy for a second that it was genuine. Instead, it was only there to try gaining sympathy and more potential viewers. Even if the apology was genuine, Charlie says that what EDP had been proven to do was unforgivable, and the best thing he could do was lock himself up. You can't come on this video and pretend like you're taking accountability or responsibility. If you're not willing to actually tackle what happened and what you were guilty of and actually talk about it directly, then you can't pretend that you're somehow taking accountability or responsibility in the situation. I didn't want to talk about this apology video because I don't think there's any value here. I've already made a few videos talking about EDP over the last two years with every attempt he's made to try and come back to the internet. And this is just another one of those, a desperate Hail Mary to try and monetize an internet career again because it is all he has. It is the only home that he knows. So he keeps trying. But this is just not something that you can come back from. Thus ends the story of EDP 445, forever banished to roam the cupcake aisle at Walmart. Through all of this, Charlie has consistently updated his enormous fan base on new developments and what to look for, making a total of nine separate videos discussing Bryant Moreland's life. Some have said Charlie was just milking the situation after the enormous success of the first video. However, it really seems like he's trying to get the word out to as many people as possible. Whether you think he's milking it or not, the fact that he's keeping up with EDP and potentially saving viewers who don't of the full context, from watching him is a commendable effort. Any way to shift attention from a self-admitted predator is a good thing. And as for whether or not critical kill the dude's career, well, trying to screw kids will usually end your career anyway, but a channel as large as Penguin Zero signal boosting the allegations certainly doesn't hurt. Nicholas Perry, or Nick Akato Avocado, was probably not the most famous mukbanger of all time, but he may be the most infamous. Two steps ahead. I am always two steps ahead. Wow. This has been the greatest social experiment I've come to know. Initially known for his extremely energetic vegan and fitness videos, his career would take a new direction as he shifted focus into what was essentially the opposite of promoting health, mukbangs. Mukbang is a phenomenon originating in South Korea that involves people eating insane quantities of food while narrating the experience to their audience. The appeal of mukbang videos lies in their ability to satiate two primary human instincts, food and social interaction. Nick has subverted this by replacing typical social interaction with chaos. Audiences are drawn to the odd pleasure of watching a 400 pound man indulge in a feast while he cries, screams, farts, makes strange noises, and does weird monologues about his life, seemingly doing a Joker impression, usually ending with him destroying everything in frame. Nick's videos often feature exaggerated reactions, meltdowns, and call-outs of other YouTubers. Because of this, viewers have pointed out how he uses sensationalism for views and exploits his personal life for online fame. Which is definitely true. I mean, the guy's basically eating himself into the grave on camera, and he's very aware of it. The dude's having fun. Cheers! One thing very consistent with Nick's content is his idiocy. Not genuine idiocy, but his over-exaggerated performances of trying to seem like a doofus when he's clearly not. Nick has only ever seemed to be serious a few times, but even then, the way he talks is so over-the-top and comical that viewers can't tell if he's joking or not. Nevertheless, it's almost uncanny to see him break character, showing fans that he isn't as dumb as he makes himself out to be. I feel as if my life has been positioned to where I'm monitoring ants on an ant farm. One follows another, follows another, follows another. It's, it's mesmerizing, it's enthralling, it's spellbinding. Just look at all these consumers. 
His emotional outbursts and public breakdowns prompted discussions about mental health in the context of how obese he had gotten over the years. Watching this healthy, skinny guy transform into an ogre had genuinely concerned some people, regardless of if he was just playing a character. Viewers had been enamored watching Nick essentially ruin his body over the years, so much so that they had never stopped to think about how this actually affected his physical well-being. One YouTuber to voice his concern, of course, would be Charlie, uploading, This YouTuber is slowly killing himself for views. Charlie's main point of contention is Nick's viewer base. Nick has gone on to blame his viewers for encouraging his kind of content, and Charlie 100% agrees, finding it to be a sickening cycle of getting more views and becoming more and more unhealthy. While there is a sense of irony to the content, regardless of the humorous aspects, it's still watching a man gorge himself on upwards of 5,000 calories on an almost daily basis. The viewers being there, supporting him monetarily, are knowingly or unknowingly taking part in Nick's slow motion suicide. He said, it's your fault for encouraging these videos. Now he's, he says shit like this pretty often, and it shows me that there's still some self-awareness deep within him somewhere, locked, locked deep away. But that rational side of him, he keeps buried, locked in a cage, and still does this content, even knowing better, even knowing that it's a complete detriment to his overall health and well-being. As you probably noticed from the screenshot, the last six days he's posted a video each day talking about his disability and his new diet with it, and each one he has tons and tons of food from different places, and it's not clickbait. He really eats all of that food. Very rarely does he not finish his plate. He usually finishes it or gets very close to it. Almost nothing goes to waste. It goes right into Nakato Avocado's gut. And one thing you may have also noticed from that screenshot is his views are high, which is exactly why he does it. The video would quickly gain traction as viewers interested in Nick's story wanted to hear what Charlie had to say about it. And Nick, being aware of how massive of an opportunity this was, played into the drama for attention. He begins by pretending to not know who Charlie is. He says critical shouldn't fixate on how he looks and overall provides adequate bait for the audience to make fun of him. Who are you? Who is this? Who is this person? Penguins Zero. Who is this person? Who is you? This person thought it would be cute to sit down on the computer and talk about my weight and my appearances and to fixate on how I look. Extremely good at an instrument. I think it was the violin, if I remember correctly. And he was what? was extremely good or still is extremely good. First of all, who are you to say that I was healthy because I was skinny? Does skinny equal healthy? Charlie himself responded a few hours after this, making what seemed to be the fastest drama response of all time. He expressed disappointment in how Nick refused to break out of character and not take anything he said seriously. He also didn't like how Nick placed ads for his Patreon and cameo in what he viewed to be a genuinely serious subject. First of all, it's entirely in character. It's kind of like in the Side Squad movie where Jared Leto was constantly being the Joker, even offset, so he was sending his co-stars like used condoms and dead pig carcasses. That's kind of what Nakato Avocado has done. He is constantly playing his character. He has become the Joker of mukbangs. It also doesn't really sit right to me that in this response video he puts multiple advertisements for like going to his Patreon and stuff like that. It just shows that he doesn't really take any of it seriously. It feels like this response was just made to capitalize off drama clicks. Like, you know, I, I just feel like he's never serious anymore. It's always in this act, in this character. This would be Charlie's final response video. After a back and forth, Nick responded to his complaints of not being genuine by screaming, plugging his cameo, and continuing to stay in character. With no response, Nick made another video titled, Penguin Zero and Mr. Beast Ruined Me, this time eating Mr. Beast Burger while having a full-on meltdown. Despite two different clear attempts at baiting Charlie to respond again, he never would, apparently realizing that Nick would never make a serious response and was just thriving off of the attention. Charlie had clearly lost any hope that Nick was willing to lose weight and live a healthier lifestyle, so instead of feeding the flames and continuing to respond, he just stopped outright. The Nick and Charlie drama subsided after this and the two went their separate ways. Nick continued to make mukbangs and gain weight, while Charlie continued to make his commentary videos. That is, until late April 2023. Apparently, Nick had lost 89 pounds. Now, this is also the same video where he slobbered himself with pizza, but progress is progress. Noticing this on Twitter, Charlie made a video expressing his happiness that Nick had lost almost 100 pounds, and goes on to say that he hopes he reaches an even healthier weight in the future. And I've always maintained that it would be amazing to see him start losing the weight, and now to see him actually start taking steps down 
down that path. I think that's fantastic and I have nothing but amazing things to say about that and a huge round of applause because there's a lot of hard work that goes into this. Afterwards, it seemed like everything ended on a positive note. However, Nick is still posting mukbangs and has even recently said that he gained all the weight back, but that could just be him in character trying to get more attention, it's hard to say. What matters is Charlie's criticism wasn't all for naught and could even be slightly credited with why Nick lost all the weight he had. Nick Hikado as a channel is still doing well view-wise and fans have actually been supportive of his journey in the comments. This is the Nick we want. We miss the lighthearted videos like this, you enjoying your food, things like that. And we don't hate you, we just want to see you happy and healthy. Hopefully Nick sees this support as an indicator that he doesn't have to be fatally obese to pull views, but only time will tell. Sneeko is a controversial figure to say the least. Starting out as a more introspective video essay YouTuber, he would carve out a niche for himself in the digital hellscape by making videos that tackle deep topics, like sexism, religion, social media addiction, and so on. Over the years, he garnered a devoted following by making thought-provoking content like his series, The One Minute Podcast, a show where he interviewed strangers on the street and discussed a wide array of nuanced and sometimes controversial subjects. But there was a turning point in Sneeko's career that arrived during 2022, coinciding with the rapid rise in popularity of another prominent figure, Andrew Tate. As Red Pill content became more popular, Sneeko saw an opportunity to evolve his channel further and gain a new audience. He began live streaming on his second channel, Sneeko, on a daily basis, covering more and more controversial subjects and promoting Andrew Tate heavily. His channel began to grow exponentially after this, and he kept pushing on full steam ahead, often espousing outlandish opinions on stream and interviewing controversial political figures. His stream got so big that it became one of the largest on YouTube, regularly getting around 20,000 live viewers. His willingness to explore contentious subjects often led to heated debates, drawing the attention of an even more wide-ranging audience. Unfortunately, due to some of the opinions he was espousing, such as his takes on the election and vaccines, his channel was eventually terminated for violating the YouTube community guidelines. Sneeko quickly migrated to Rumble and has hosted his content there ever since. In May of 2022, Critical uploaded Most Embarrassing Alpha Male Ever, a critique of the Fresh and Fit podcast. Charlie pointed out scenarios that looked entirely made up to him and seemed like just a way to con people into spending money. But today we're going to talk about my W in terms of having three women in one day. Let me stop you right there. I already don't believe you. It's super hard to think that anything they say is real when they constantly make stupid f***ing claims like this one. There is no reality in the entirety of the f***ing multiverse where this man has slept with one woman, let alone over a thousand of them. Doctor Strange could peer into an endless multiverse and never find one where this guy has slept with a thousand women. They just say a whole bunch of made-up bullshit constantly. Apart from the occasional comment, nothing had really come from this video in terms of controversy, until a few months later. Sneeko would come across this video and would take a huge issue with Charlie's take, getting so heated that he paused the video to bring up a picture of his girlfriend, who he then proceeded to roast. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say names, someone texts me, he's in a monogamous relationship. This is his girl. So there you go. At first, it didn't seem like Critical cared, but after his fans had insisted he respond to this, he finally did a few days later. And his response was not pretty, releasing what was basically a 12-minute roast of Sneeko and his past, bringing up various things like his infamous positive review of cuties and an extremely embarrassing story of actually getting this was my first real exposure to Sneeko, and it's also the reason I don't care what his opinion is of me, because it's coming from a man who likes cuties. So why the f*** would it matter if he thinks I'm a bitch or anything like that? It legitimately couldn't mean less coming from a guy who openly defends a softcore child production. But I couldn't help but take notice of one of his more recent viral clips, where he openly defends getting c***ed. Imagine seeing the girl you love, like, get f***ed. Get f***ed. Her? Yeah, I do. I love it. Yeah, I love her. I was about to say I love this bitch. I'm like, no, nah, let me not say that. I love my, my queen. wifey, my queen. And you allowed the love of your life to get, to get f by another man. What happened to the other three? Is there, is there, is there, there, I'm crazy. The first time, as soon as I saw like three pumps in, I just got up and walked out. I'm just like, I can't. It is a legitimately super sad thing to sit there and listen to because Sneeko is very clearly bothered by that whole situation, but he's trying to play it off like a deeper message like, no, this is actually a good thing. And in fact, I recommend every guy out there try letting their girl get f***ed by another man. Then you'll know if it's real, if this is the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. It is f***ing tragic. Sneeko's response to this was not so subtle. Pattern recognition. This collage is everyone who advocated for my cancellation. Fight back and follow my rumble. While it didn't go viral, it did get Charlie's attention, who didn't pull any punches. Holy sh**, you pathetic, sensitive, soy little worm. I made fun of you for watching your girlfriend get f 
by numerous other men, and also insulted you for defending CP. That's not cancellation, that's just spitting on you for being a pitiful, sad c after this, a reply chain would start with Sneeko expressing interest in fighting Charlie. Like this tweet if you want to see us fight. You know in your soul you would never say that to my face. You literally have a collage of people that hurt your feelings on the internet. You haven't stopped whining about me for months now, you goofy NPC. Even if you beat my ass in a fight, it doesn't change the truth. You're still a c who also defends CP. You're not special from the other 10 soy boys who say the same thing. If you got a problem, stop talking on the internet. Let's solve it. Got your Discord still working on responses? Brother, I have no problem. You started it, and I made fun of you in return. You're upset about publicly admitting the c**ldry and getting mad at me for bringing it up. You should be mad at yourself instead. Have some self-reflection. After the Twitter spat, fans were getting excited as the controversy started to get bigger and bigger. Everyone was waiting to see when Charlie would inevitably respond again. And on March 14th, he did. The day after I posted my response, he went on stream and had a huge unhinged tantrum and meltdown about the whole thing and then he sent some of his viewers over so I was joking with them saying like oh you guys must have just stopped the cuties watch party over there at Sneeko's stream right welcome cucks, that kind of sh and it got really under his skin in a big way so he started dancing around with the gun and threatening to come sh me so he kept saying oh you're in Tampa right I'll come see you waving his gun around and dancing you want to watch my clips watch my clips watch my clips you want to? Oh, you want me to watch your clips? Watch my clips. <laughs> These are the only clips I'm watching. You are now. The reason he keeps saying "watch my clips" while threatening me here is because during the stream I couldn't watch him live because he just kept shouting slurs. So I said, "Watch my clips" to see what I was saying about you. I had to communicate via Twitch clips. And I'm sorry to be that guy. This is like the grammar police of guns, but he's a fucking imbecile. You absolute buffoon. What you have there is not clips. These are mags. They're mags, not clips, you absolute f***ing dummy. The same way that this is also a mag. They're all mags. Stop saying clips, you look f***ing stupid here. This clip alone went insanely viral almost instantly, with viewers even more pumped to see what would happen next. Hey, there's me. Charlie continued to voice his hatred of Sneeko and reiterated what he had in the previous callout video. This time, however, he made a point to detail how Sneeko had been trying to avoid a fight with Brandon Buckingham, another creator that he had beef with. So this puffing out his chest of challenging me to a fight is clearly attention. That's what it feels like. Because you don't have the same energy for Brandon Buckingham. Brandon Buckingham is more than willing to fight you any day of the week. But with him, you don't want to do that for some reason. Why? Do you not stand by your beliefs when it comes to Brandon Buckingham? He has said all the same things about you that I am saying about you. So why is he exempt? Hmm? Why don't you want to fight him? Critical clearly had no intention to fight, but Brandon did. After this response was uploaded, it absolutely blew up in views, gaining 13 million hits. The audience watching remarked how it felt like they had never seen such a blowout in one's favor, with Sneeko left in the seat once again. On March 15th, KSI joined in on the Sneeko hate train, posting a meme referencing the story. Sneeko Stop ducking Brandon Buckingham. He's down to fight. Don't tell me Sneeko is scared. The drama surrounding this situation was hitting critical mass, and it felt like everyone was looking for ways to dunk on Sneeko. Nothing else even needed to be said by Charlie, and for the most part, it seemed like Sneeko had taken the definitive L. Despite this, on April 1st, Critical uploaded I Talk to Sneeko, shocking almost everyone involved. We just haven't liked each other. We haven't seen eye to eye on many things, so our internet beef has become this fine Wagyu steak. It's, it's been this very tasty tasty, juicy bit of drama between the two of us, and today, it finally boiled over and we had a conversation. Charlie would go on to say he was shocked by how easy it was to have a conversation with Sneeko, and he was expecting him to be much more aggressive and defensive, but in contrast to his videos and tweets, he came across more reasonable. This was a very laid-back, very calm and collected Sneeko, who was actually more than willing to concede on some of his points, as well as see different sides of situations, and I didn't expect that. And I'm very appreciative of that pleasant surprise as well because I went into this with pretty low expectations but after finishing our talk I'm actually pretty curious to see where Sneeko goes next. Obviously this wouldn't resolve every issue between them. The pair still disagreed over influencer responsibility towards audiences along with ideological differences but apart from that the conversation had gone pretty well. After our conversation there really wasn't a ton of hostility left. I really feel like Sneeko built me up very differently in his head to paint me as a villain in his own mind and 
the reality is I just didn't match that description. Now, for me, I did know a lot about Sneeko, but after talking to him, I feel like a large part of that is a persona that he's putting on. The way he conducted them himself in this conversation, I was actually really surprised with. He was much more calm. It, like, he is still very passionate, clearly, but he's not having a f***ing conniption and a meltdown like I've seen him do so many times in the past. Despite not seeing eye to eye, viewers watching Charlie and Sneeko mostly make peace was a shock to many. Internet drama almost never ends in a conversation, so it was nice to see the value of meeting someone in the middle and letting bygones be bygones. And it's also worth noting that Sneeko would later release a video essay on his channel, and while he was still critical of Charlie, he apologized for bringing up a picture of his girlfriend. Mad respect for both of them talking in a civil manner, not talking over one another. While there would still be tension, the majority of it was diffused during this interview, and viewers went back to watching their respective favorite creator. Sneeko continues making content on Rumble to this day, and there's no telling what kind of wacky hijinks he'll get into next. I've been Turkey Tom, thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone.